All right. How'd you like that intro? Pretty spiff, huh? I thought it was pretty spiff. I, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I worked on that last night for a, <clears throat> a few hours. You know, I, I felt like the show needed uh, an intro, right? And um, something that had that kind of far effect, you know, and I was going through all kinds of, <clears throat> excuse me, um, like, I don't know, potential pieces of content, like radio signals, like uh, I must have gone through at least 20 old Russian science fiction movies. By the way, if you ever want to be entertained, go find old Russian science fiction movies on YouTube. A lot of them have subtitles. They're fucking nuts. They're crazy. The Russians had really weird sci-fi movies and they made them. I mean, they're obviously they had a you know, party content and all that bullshit, but some are pretty interesting and really strange uh, looking. So if you're bored and want some entertainment, go hunt down old Russian sci-fi space movies. You'll, you'll be entertained. Like I said, most of them have subtitles too. Um, welcome everybody to another edition of 15 minutes of flame. What do I have? Over? How do I get that? It's focus here. It's a little tacky, isn't it? We have a great show today. Really great show. Um, so earlier in the week, I was joined by the great Shamika Michelle, and uh, she's becoming legendary. This woman, let me tell you. Um, I I found her through Jason Whitlock. She started to pop up on Jason Whitlock. Let me take this off here. She popped up on Jason Whitlock and became the like the first lady of Fearless. And she is absolutely unique, one of a kind. Um, and she's starting to really take off because I think she's on Fearless at least three or four times a week. And I think, I think she went over to, she, she had a spot on Fox on the uh, Jesse Waters show. So she's starting to blow up. Now she's been around a bit. She's an author. Um, she's written a book about her life, which is an extremely interesting life. She has a podcast that she does as well. And uh, hopefully I'll get to be a guest on her podcast because I found out she's got an interest in astrology. So I put together a clip of, there's, she has so many good moments on Jason on Fearless, I put together a clip so that you guys could get a sense, a really quick sense as to Shamika's, uh, how do I say this? Authenticity. So let me play it for you here. All right. Did you enjoy the miniseries about Colin Kaepernick? Well, since they did the whole in love, in living color thing, let me do like the two gays on there and say, hated it. It was terrible. <laughs> it was the worst thing that I have seen in a very long time. It was really bad, Jason, really bad. And what did I found its depiction of racism really bad because I, I thought it was like, well, this is like some 12 year old kids and how they perceive or 10 year olds, how they perceive racism playing out. And, and then I, I thought the demonization of his parents, adoptive parents, I thought that was really bad. And then the way he defined being black. I thought was really bad, but what stood out to you? What made it bad to you? 
Well, I think when I grabbed my pen and paper was when he wanted to give us a lesson on hip hop. And I was thinking, I have seen Breaking, Beat Street, and Crush Groove. Like, I do not need a lesson on hip hop from someone who looks like he could have been a backup dancer for Menudo. That was the first thing that irritated me about the, the entire show. And then I noticed that he had a, 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 an actor play him who was much darker than Kyle. Colin, whose hair is a lot more coarse than Colin. And I think this was in an effort to really make us believe that Colin was harassed his entire life by white people. And if you look at Colin in his younger years, there's nothing that says black, that just screams black about Colin. So I definitely don't feel like he was being harassed by white people his entire life. If anything, I think that he was harassed by black men, especially darker black men who probably told him to sit his $5 ass down before they made change. You know, once Colin came through, the Alvy Shures and the Christopher Williams, they were out. You know, Wesley Snipes and Marsh Chestnut, they were in. So I just feel like this was a terrible effort for Colin, Colin to just make it seem as he was the blackest black dude on the planet. And it was very unbelievable. The I was just talking with Rashad about this. I'm not a there's not a thousand percent proof that Kaepernick's daddy is actually black. I've heard people argue like he looks more Middle Eastern than black. Yeah, I think we could probably find Colin's daddy somewhere walking in the desert, wearing a pair of sandals, stopping periodically to milk his pet goat. There is nothing that really just screams black to me. His nose, the hook in his nose looks like I could hang my coat on it. I just don't believe the whole, you know, my daddy is black and I hate to be the one that has to qualify black people, but it, it Colin just comes across so inauthentic that I feel like he opens the door for me to just say, boy, sit down. I, I just don't believe that. Looks like his daddy could, he could, uh, Colin looks like he could own a 7-Eleven. Because LeBron James is an intellectual midget. And there are some people that are going to say, well, he, he built a school. Listen, I don't care if he would have built Harvard. All that shows is that he had the money and the resources to do so. It doesn't mean that he's intelligent in any way. And what, what I find crazy about LeBron saying anything is that he didn't even seem to address when the other NBA player came out about the, the, the Muslims or the people that are being mistreated. LeBron said nothing. But now you have all of this smoke for an 18 year old. That to me is a coward. That's to me is like, okay, you're boxing with someone not even in your weight, you know, weight range. Why? Why would you have anything to say after what we saw last year? Why, why not just keep quiet as you usually do? Just be China's bitch and just wait for something in, in, in that bag. I think the biggest mistake black women are making is we don't know how to shut up. You know, a man who has been out fighting in the world all day, he doesn't want to come home and listen to you nag all day long. And a lot of times women like to bait men into senseless arguments every day, just emotional foolishness. And I know that they do it because I have friends or associates that if I offend them or hurt them in any kind of way, they'll send these long drawn out text messages, you know, just trying to, to bait you into an emotional conversation. A man that is worried about putting a roof over your head, food on the table, clothes on your back, he doesn't have time for that. So I think one of the biggest mistakes is that black women don't know how to shut up. And one of the mistakes that men are making is trying to, you know, uh, meet them 50-50. You can't go half and half on craziness. You know, men need to stand flat-footed and have certain standards and require that women meet those standards. Or if not, Leave them, leave them be. When it comes to Lil Nas X and 
you know, seeing men in dresses, I think that it, it has a negative effect. Of course, the first role model should always be in the home. That's one of the things that I appreciate about my, my girl's father. He told me very early on, you're going to be the first example to these girls of what a woman is. And I've always taken that, you know, to heart and, and, and held that has been very important to me. So I think, you know, when you don't have that in the home, they do look outside to, to entertainment, to TV, and what we're showing is just not conducive in producing families. You know, how do you destroy a culture? You destroy the community. How do you destroy the community? You destroy the family. How do you destroy the family? You destroy the man. And that's what we've been doing, especially in the black community, is really trying to destroy to destroy the man and it has not helped us it's only hurt us and we have to make a change or we're doomed well that's some uh, sagittarius rising truth telling right there i could have gone through hours of clips and put together an even longer reel there's some there, there are some nuggets that she says throughout these episodes with Jason that are fantastic. And some of them are just outright funny, like so funny. Like there was there, she did a, well, I'm going to play it because when we get to the interview part, there's a clip that I will play. We're going to talk about it. But uh, there was this, there, there was a, a, an episode where um, this guy punches this woman on a New York subway. Okay. She's white. He's black. They get into it. Right. And she probably should have kept her mouth shut. He probably shouldn't have hit her. You know, you've got two parties here that are, are engaging in some form of baiting one another because they're 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 both tense. They both probably had enough, right? So this guy, the black guy, hits the woman in the face. The woman's husband is there too on the subway, and. <laughs> Um, she said to Jason that that dude was nuttier than Monica Lewinsky's blue dress. And Jay, when I heard that, I lost it. And Jason lost it too. He, it was one of the funniest damn lines. If you know what I'm talking about, nuttier, meaning that, you know, there was uh, some, some white stains on uh, Monica Lewinsky's blue dress. So we know what uh, nutty means in that, in that vernacular. So there's just tons and tons and tons of um, just total a roll material there. And I tried to, you know, distill some of the best parts of, of what she brings to the show. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play the interview and it's uh, a, close to an hour and uh, we're going to get into um, a lot of this and more. Um, and after we, you know, we conclude this interview, Jeffrey Doherty, um, should be checking in and joining the show shortly thereafter. And what's interesting about, um, Shamika and Jeffrey is that they're both former ordained ministers. They both left the church. So I get into that a little bit with Shamika and we'll, we'll find out why. So let's find out more about her and, um, uh, let's just get right into this interview that we did together. There we go. This was on Monday. And uh, Jason hasn't had a, a show all week. So I feel pretty lucky that I get to play some Shamika content, even though there's no Fearless this week. All right, here we go. All right, hold on. And so today, which is a pre-record, and you'll be seeing this on Friday, my Friday show, um, I'm joined by the great Shamika Michelle, who has kind of taken uh, YouTube by storm in a lot of ways, showing up on Jason Whitlock's show, Fearless. And uh, first of all, what's really, by the way, thank you again for being here, Shamika. It's really, again, a real honor to have you. 
And, Thank you for having me. And, 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 it's, and I think it's an honor being on Jason's show because he doesn't have a lot of women on there. Am I right? Oh, for sure. Yes. I'm the first lady of fearless. So I'm the, I'm the only one that's consistent. And, and you know what I've noticed about, about Jason is that like, if you're not hot and you're not cutting the mustard, he'll kind of, <laughs> he'll kind of cut you loose. Oh, for sure. Definitely. Every, every time I'm up there, I have that in the back of my head. Like I want to be able to come back again. <laughs> like, like Greg Roush is in the, uh, uh, missing persons, uh, you know, file right now. He was on there for maybe the first month of fearless. And, and I think he went South on Jason with the show, the white shadow, and he never came back. Like he was really, gone. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that at all. I see people asking about him, but I wasn't watching the show prior to being on the show. I would watch the clips that they would post, um, but I didn't watch the show in its entirety. Yeah. So he was, he was, he didn't last very long. And, uh, and I noticed that Leonidas isn't on the show that much anymore either. And I'm not sure what that's about. He seems like a really nice guy, though. I think they could turn the passion up a little bit on Leonidas. For sure. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's very passionate um, over social media, but I do understand what you're saying as far as watching him. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll tell you who I do like a lot and I don't think gets enough screen time is Dave Shannon. I think. Oh, yes. Dave Shannon is very interesting. And I always, always appreciate his, uh, his takes uh, because number one, he comes from a Christian perspective mm -hmm. but he's got but he's also got kind of a bigger worldview than that too like he's just not locked into sort of the biblical interpretation of reality which i i appreciate as well how did jason find you he found me on twitter actually because i interact with delano's post a lot uh, because i just love the things that delano has to say and delano came on the podcast that i co-host cut the bull with um Charles Love and Wilfred Riley. And so I interact with him a lot and we kind of, you know, interact back, back and forth. So that's how Jason found me. Delano's special. Yes. He's Professor really Delano. Yep. <laughs> oh, by the way, I made the call that you were going to go on Fox next and you did. I, I, did. I, I tweeted that out. I said, First, Delano, you're next, and then you went on there on the on the Jesse Waters show. Right? Yes, right. Mm -hmm. so I knew that was coming. Let's take a quick look here at this Everpedia page because it has some information um, about you that we can glean. It's all just scratching the surface, obviously, but it gives people kind of a rough idea of Shamika. So here we are. We have the. Uh, Make America Naked Again, which I think is brilliant. Um, we could talk a little bit more about that. You, know, you studied biology at uh, NCANT. You started and then uh, you succumbed to partyitis, which a lot of people do in college. <laughs> uh, and then you, you wrote this very interesting book, Naked, A Naked Girl's Guide to Live Life Authentically, a self-help book based on Michelle's real life experiences. The book discusses topics from relationships and parenting to religion and divorce. So how, how, how has that book been received? And have you, have you sold a few copies of that? Uh, it's, it was received very well. I don't know how much it's uh, selling now. I get a, a note from Amazon that they're going to be depositing money into my account but it doesn't tell me prior to some, uh, they used to tell me like how many were sold in the emails. They don't say that anymore. It just lets me know that money is coming to my account because of the, the sales. And, but when I initially wrote it, I released it in December of 2016. So it's been a while. Mm -hmm. uh, initially it did very well. Um, and it's still selling. I think that more people get to see me and they come across me and they realize that I've written a book, then they are interested in getting it and seeing what it's about. 
which is a really great book. I had to read uh, a little bit of it because I was doing an interview and I was thinking, oh my God, who wrote this? <laughs> Isn't that funny? You go back and you read something you wrote and you say, I wrote that? Right. I'm like, like, ooh, she was really smart. <laughs> <laughs> so may maybe it's time for you to write another book. It is, definitely. I'm in talks of writing a book on feminism. Uh I just have to sit down and actually get started and do it. Right. And now you're, you're in demand, you're everywhere. So it's hard to do that. You've got three, three girls, right? Yes. Three <laughs> girls, 16, 18 and 25. And how are they doing? They're doing great. I have one who is, you know, the 25 year old, she's grown working girl and I have an 18 year old who's in college and my 16 year old, she's technically a junior in high school, but she's done with all her high school classes. So she's only taking college courses because she's in an early college program. So they're, they're all doing great. And you've, you've done a, a marvelous job being a, a single parent mostly, right? Yes. Uh, um, what, well, what, yeah, what, I don't live with their father, but he is present. So, yeah. So most, I wanted to qualify that. So he's in yeah. their life. They, they're, he, he's just not with you. Right. Well, but, well, I mean, I'm assuming he's a good, he's a good dude that he's there and that's got to be a blessing. Am I right? It is for sure. Um, I see some of some women who have to actually do it all by themselves. So that's why I, try to never take credit or make it seem as if I'm just this single woman holding it down by myself. I like to say that I can only be the mother that I am to them because he is the father that he is to them. So um, I'm going to ask you a, a question. It's culturally based. Um, mm -hmm. Is that unusual in the black community to have a father who's not a part of the family still be a part of the family and co-parent? I, I, the way we do it, yes, it yeah. seems to be unusual because a lot of people have a hard time really grasping the fact that we get along so well and that we do everything together when it comes to the kids. I, and I wouldn't even say just in, in the Black community. I, I hear a lot of people say, wow, when they hear that we celebrate holidays together, we celebrate birthdays together. If our children are uh, participating in a sporting event or I have a daughter that does sports and theater, if she's in a play, we sit together. You know, we make sure, you know, hey, have you gotten there? I'm on the way or get my ticket or whatever. You know, we do everything together and our kids have never had to really make a decision or feel uncomfortable. Like I have to like mommy more or like daddy more we do everything together for christmas they don't open gifts until he gets to the house when they were a little younger so th yeah. this this is an, an interesting point now i i was in a co-parenting situation and honestly i thought co-parenting sucked it, mm -hmm. it, was, it was like it, it, it was it was the worst part of probably the relationship you had anyway, which was raising your, your kids. Cause I had a fundamental difference in how I wanted to raise my son and how my ex-wife wanted to raise him. Mm -hmm. And so now we're supposed to raise them together apart. It was an, it was an absolute nightmare. So I, I, I'll, let me ask you this question. So do, do you and your ex-husband basically share the same fundamental values, which has allowed you to, to do what you're doing? Yes, I think so. And not only that, I was looking at someone's uh, Twitter thread when they were saying, somebody was saying my, like my ex got my child the vaccine against my wishes and I'm so upset and blah, blah, blah. And I was just thinking, I am really blessed that he trusted me to be their mom. Like he's never questioned a decision you know, that I've made in reference to them, or I can tell him how I feel about something and he respects that. So even just talking about the vaccine early on, I went to him and told him my feelings on it, why I felt the way that I did. Him knowing that I was a biology major knew that, you know, the position I took was not just a political position, but that it was also based on what I thought I knew about the human body. 
and he respected it. Like it, it was never an argument. It was never any type of disagreement or him trying to bring anybody else into the equation to get me to think differently. It was, this is what their mom is saying and that's it. That's just what it is. And he's been that way the entire time. You know, he is the one that actually works and provide for the family. I am the primary nurturer. So he's never questioned me on what I thought was best for them when it came to school, when it came to their health. It's always, you know, if this is what you think is best, then this is what I'm going to do. Just as I said, if this is what you feel is best financially for our family, then that's what he does without me, you know, disagreeing. So we kind of allow each other to stay in our lane and we work fine together. So it sounds to me like you have the perfect marriage. It's not a marriage. Right. <laughs> That's weird. Exactly. It's a little weird, I have to say, but it's okay, <laughs> right? Whatever works. Yeah. A lot of people say that. And so it's just so funny to me because I'm like, we really have this parent co-parenting thing down pat, but people are like, that's kind of weird. And it's, I can say that, you know, when dating other people, they've had to get used to it because that it can bring in some insecurities that you feel like, well, if you all get along this well, do you still want to be together? And it's like, absolutely not. We get along this well because we know it's over. There is no chance of a reconciliation. So we might as well be friends. <laughs> you know, that's called being an adult. Right. right. You, you, you're, you're adulting. And I guess some people would just, you know, find that really hard to wrap their heads around because most people can't operate from that, that plane of consciousness. Well, good for you. Um, so let me, okay, let, let's talk a little bit about your past. Mm -hmm. You were, you were, you were a stripper, which you talk about in your book, and mm -hmm. you were also an ordained minister which yes. is really interesting. Like you got this heaven and hell sort of thing, Satan center thing, which, right. is, which is not all that uncommon sometimes when you really get into like, like heavy duty faith, right? You'll find people that are just consumed by God or passion and it'll, it'll move in a lot of different directions. Um, so the, the, the stripper part, how old were you and how long did you do that for? So when I started working in a club, I was 18. I was waiting for my 18th birthday because I said, when I turn 18, I want to be a stripper. I don't know why. I don't know where that really came from or why I had this fascination with it. But I knew that when I turned 18, that's what I wanted to do. So when I turned 18, I was looking in the want, the want ads of the newspaper and I saw an ad. I was actually at a and at the time. I was in college. And I called the number. He told me I needed to wear something form-fitting and to come in and let him see me. I did. And he was like, you're hired. Have you ever danced before? And I was like, no, you know, not professionally. And he asked, well, what? Um, he, he got one of the other girls to come and take me to a stage that no one was using at the time to teach me some moves. And she said, well, what's your stage name? And I looked at her like, what? And she said, you have to have a stage name. You can't allow them to call you by your real name. You want to keep that separate. And so she named me and gave me, she said, well, you can have one of my old names. She named me India. That was my stage name. And she said, I'm going to bring you a couple outfits because I didn't have anything. And that's that's what I did. I only did it for, um, I don't know, several months. I was dating a guy who I think he got wind of the fact that that's what I was doing because I was always gone for a certain amount of time. And uh, back then it wasn't popular. Like now women kind of brag about it. Like, oh, I'm a stripper and you have people, you know, Oh, oh yeah oh yeah you're you're it's like status the status symbol now yeah then it wasn't it wasn't popular you know early 90s so I kept it quiet from people but then they would see me like after work and be like why do you have this makeup on you know because the women there had you know made my face up or whatever and we were having a conversation me and the guy that I was dating and he said you know if I ever found out you were doing something like that, I would never talk to you again. 
And that like crushed me. The thought of him never talking to me again, just hearing how passionate he was about it, I stopped. Um, but I had been doing it for, I don't know, it was less than a year. Mm-hmm. Right. So it wasn't really long, but that's why I stopped because he said if he ever found out, and I think he knew, but that was his way of giving me a chance to walk away. And I did. I mean, it's an interesting level of training in some ways because you're dealing with really basic fundamental levels of psychology, uh, the projection of need, uh, all these, you know, really kind of base human emotions or base human desires. And then you're dealing with what's going on with the other dancers, the power relationship with the owner of the club. Mm -hmm. I mean, I bet you learned a lot just from those experiences alone. I learned a lot. And I think I was the youngest person there. So, mm -hmm. like, you know, everybody wanted to take me under their wing. And I did learn a lot. I learned that also that you can kind of get what you want. When they say use what you got to get what you want. I feel like I learned that in that club. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Also, I worked the early shift because I was so young. We had a lot of men that would come right from work. And so they would, you know, I went in at like four o'clock and I would be there from like four to nine, maybe 10. So I was there. I was never like a, one of the late night workers. So I got to interact with a lot of businessmen who were coming straight from work and that sometimes they just wanted a good conversation. So I'm 18 and I'm just soaking it all in. Right. Right. In very interesting. Then you do a 180, you become an ordained minister. What period was that in your life? So let's see. I was married at 26. So I started preaching, I think, at 27. Or maybe I was 26. Somewhere around 26, 27. So it was some years, of, you know, eight to nine years after being a stripper that I um, went into the ministry. And I knew I had a message and I just thought at the time, like when you know that you have a message for people, mm -hmm. times you end up doing that initially in church, at least in the black community, you think, well, I know I'm here for a purpose. I know that God can use me um, as a vessel to, to, to speak. I always knew that I had the ability to speak to people. I always knew that I had the ability to say things that some people could only think and would never say. Mm -hmm. so I felt like I had this supernatural um, guts, you know, just the, the wherewithal to just go and say what needed to be said, where some people would not do that. So I knew that I had that because there were times where I would feel like there was just like this unction, just this push on my back, like, say this, you know, say it now, say it this way. And so I ended up preaching in the church and I was in the church as a preacher for about 10 years, 10 mm -hmm. or 10 years. Now you, then you stepped away from that. You, mm -hmm. Then that's a really interesting change of course in one's life what what made you walk away and what kind of criticism did you receive as a result of that what made me walk away is that I didn't like the division that I encountered in the church or that I saw in the church the hierarchy the wanting to you know the titles and people feeling like a certain title made you better than, you know, someone who didn't have a title or someone who wasn't ordained. And I just felt like I was supposed to connect with people, period, regardless of what their church affiliation was or their religious belief. I felt like it was now time for me to do something bigger and greater. So uh, I left the church because for me, a lot of it was, well, if you don't believe the way I believe, I can't talk to you. Or if you don't believe exactly what I believe, you're going to hell. Or just because church was so uh, consuming with my time, I didn't get a chance to really connect with people. And 
I'm not the person that feels like, oh, because I'm a minister and you aren't, we can't talk, we can't laugh, we can't share life experiences. Everything that I had gone through, especially after going through divorce, I felt like it's time for me to connect with other people. I've been, I've had so many life experiences that I don't want religion to divide me reaching someone else. A woman who may be sad or depressed or going through some of the things that I had gone through in life, I don't want religion to keep me from reaching her. So for me, I felt like I had a good foundation. I felt like, um, you know, I can read my Bible at home or study what I feel like I need to study at home. I really want to reach people. And so after going through my divorce, I started the Naked Girls, which is just a group of women who are about to live open, honest, and emotionally exposed. And I started this with a blog. And um, I just wanted a place where women could come and hear real life experiences from other women and know they can make it too. Like, you know, if you're going through this, I've been there, I can make it. Just have honest discussion. And I started that. And I did get some negativity in the beginning because, of course, people that are in church feel like you should be in church. Right. People that know that you have a message or that, you know, maybe they thought the way I did and they just thought that message is supposed to come uh, from behind a pulpit. They had a lot to say uh, about me reaching people outside of the church or, you know, not from behind a pulpit, but that didn't last long. I don't think the, the criticism lasted very long. I actually had one of the elders of the church come to me a couple of months ago to apologize, to say, initially, I thought this girl is nuts, you know, um, and I spoke against what you were doing. He said, but it's like you have some type of prophetic gift and you speak what needs to be spoken and you see things that other people can't see. And even if it happens down the road, it comes to pass. And he said, I just wanted to call to say, good job. And I apologize for everything that I said against you, but you were right on a lot of things mm -hmm. that speaking years ago that we just couldn't see. So your ministry became personal. Really, that's what happened. Yes. Yeah. That's, I think that's very inspiring um, because <clears throat> a lot of times, and I think Christians are, are good people. I mean, they have good values and good hearts, but sometimes they just get <clears throat> like hung up on their orthodoxy mm -hmm. and, the, and the letter of the biblical law and how somebody interprets it. And then things become very narrow and they keep people out that could be real allies to them. Uh, yes. and, and they don't, they don't realize it and they're not really willing to embrace it. So good on you. It just sounds like to me, like you're, a, you're kind of a mold breaker and a trailblazer, which is what, what you are. Yes. And my kids say I'm a lot nicer now. <laughs> <laughs> well, they you, you don't have to live up to being a preacher, right? You, there's yeah. something that you got to live up to, right? Right. Like, remember Flip Wilson, here comes the judge. I mean, it's that kind of a thing. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about fearless. Uh, I, I want I, I don't have the clip ready and I'm not going to go try and find it, but mm -hmm. there's, there's this one moment where you tell Jason that you were going to shoot, you were going to shoot another girl. Mm -hmm. Right. And, yes. and, and, and the gun misfired and you were going to try it again. I think there were like kind of two shots you were trying to get the yes. look on Jason's face was like priceless. He was like, what did I just hear? Right. And, and, I, and I'm like, going, oh, my God, where is he going to go with this? Right. And Jason's pretty fearless. But I'm sure Jason's also thinking she didn't tell me about this. Right. Why didn't she? What was, I'm just curious. What was the off the mic conversation like after that show? So he basically was just like, you're going to have to come and explain this to people because I pretty much just 
So I'm so free from it. And it's, it feels like for me, it's been such a long time that I never really uh, think about how it's going to fall on the people that's hearing it. So a lot of times I'll just say something and I keep going because I'm free from it. Like it, it happened so long ago. I'm over it. I feel right. like I repented. I've turned to him. And Jason was like, you know, you're going to have to come and explain to people and, you know, what really happened and tell us the whole story. And, you know, you're going to have to show that you're remorseful. And I was like, Jason, if they're looking for me to be crying and asking for forgiveness, they're not going to get that. He, so, OK, that. Jason said that you needed to be remorseful. Right. I'm surprised that he would put that condition. And I'm not trying to get between you and Jason. I love Jason. But I'm surprised that he would he would make that kind of condition. Yeah, I think it was just so heavy on him. He was really thinking, my gosh, if it's this heavy on me, I wonder how it fell on the listeners. And he said that I, I talk about it as if it's no big deal. And I, I understood where he was coming from. And I said, you know, I talk about it because it's no big deal because it's so old. Like if they wanted to catch me, repenting and rolling in the floor they should have caught me years ago when i actually did because repent means to turn. i've already done that i'm no longer you know that person so it's going to be very hard for me to kind of present myself as somebody looking for forgiveness when i feel like i've already been forgiven mm -hmm. you know um and he understood where i was coming from because i can't even remember the scripture that I gave him, but he brought it up in the show that day as well. When I said, you know, something like that's kind of why Christians irritate me because they claim they believe certain things, but then they don't live like they actually believe them. Once you have turned away from that, once you have been forgiven, you don't have to walk around with this remorse, like in this place of remorse and guilt, the guilt is gone. Right. If you well, believe yeah. what you can't claim you believe about Christ dying on the cross, the, the guilt and the shame it's is gone. gone. It's gone. You, I mean, you're, yeah. you, 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 uh, asked for forgiveness. You repented. There was atonement, Like yes. you're, you're free. I mean, you're free right. and, and, right. for, and for you to go back and re revisit that and inject a bunch of emotions that might sound pious and, somewhat true but were false that would be evil right. actually that would be evil right so he definitely understood that like when i said it he's like okay i think because it's new it was new for him and it was new for people hearing it you don't realize that it's over 20 years ago you know like right. it's, it's been a long time so so much in my life since then it's like I tell the story because I remember, you know, somewhat or mostly, but the emotions attached to it, like, you know, I cried the night of, I was worried the night of, you know, I felt bad the night of 20 something years later, though, you're not going to get that same emotion from me. Right. And then he did an entire show based on that incident and yes and i guess he he like got okay clarity maybe it answered questions for other people maybe glenn yeah. Beck, maybe glenn beck felt a little bit better at that point or whatever <laughs> right yeah and i was stressed because i was i was doing the show and i'm thinking i'm going through my head like what else have i done bad like, well that, yeah that's the know. other thing i'm thinking too it's like jason's probably thinking well what the hell else has he done Right. Right. Can we have a little more uh, discussion? Like, were you selling drugs to 13 year olds, too, or what? You know, right. Yeah. He goes, I don't think anything because I told him that I said it was so stressful because I'm talking to you and I'm thinking, do I need to tell him about some other things that, you know, have happened in life? Like somebody died in my back seat. Do I need to tell that story? Like I'm going through all of these things in my head. And so it's making me stressed because I'm like, it's really hard to tell you 46 years of life in an hour. <laughs> you know? Well, look, it, it, so, it's almost it's way better for you to have that moment than, say, you know, two months down the line, somebody yeah. comes out and says, 
oh, Shamika Michelle, you know, fired a gun at a woman, blah, 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 blah. Because right. that's what they do. They go back and they look at your shit oh, and then for they bring sure. it forward. So, I mean, it was a blessing. You got it out. You got it out of the way. And it was very innocuous and very innocent. You were just talking about what happened. Right. Uh, but, but I'll never forget Jason's look, man. That was, he was shook. He was definitely yeah. shook. So he how was. how has being on Fearless changed your life? It's made me really busy. So it's allowed, you know, Jason is Jason Whitlock. So he has fans from years and years and years. I actually, um, one of my old um, bosses uh, reached out to me and said, I was scrolling Facebook and I love Jason Whitlock. And he said, I began to watch a clip and I said, that looks like Shamika. And then he goes, oh, my God, that is Shamika. <laughs> and he's been a fan of Jason's for so long. He owns a consultant agency. And I only got to work with him briefly because I was working at a school and they brought him in to kind of get the school out of the red and into the black, you know. And so he kind of met me there. And even then, he would always tell me, you're supposed to be doing more than sitting behind this desk. And so he would like take me into meetings with him. He had me doing the budget for the school, really talking to the higher ups, get, you know, because he just felt like I was not doing what I was supposed to do. He was right. like, I'm to talk to you all the time, like sitting behind this desk is not it. So when he saw that, he was just so excited. So I think what it's done for me is just, it's, you know, put me in front of people who otherwise would not have seen me because I've been on the internet for a long time, but now it's putting me in front of people who would not have known who I am. And so it's, I'm, I'm like really busy now doing podcasts, doing interviews, like I have to do Newsmax tonight. So it's, it's giving me the opportunity to be seen more and to be heard. Well, you deserve it because you are really fearless. A lot of the stuff you say on on a show is just piercing and funny, like <laughs> really funny. We're going to play something here real fast. But be, before I do that, I just want to go through a few more things with fearless. Um, mm -hmm. Don't you think Jason needs to be a dad? Yes, I think it would give him an experience that he hasn't had, you know, um, He's getting on up there age, though. I don't know, you know, if he wants to look like the grandpa at, at the soccer game. But <laughs> uh, I think it would give him an experience that he's, he's never had. Um, I don't know. My oldest daughter says that she doesn't want children. I think some people really accept maybe that that's not their lot in life. I don't know. We don't talk about it a lot, a lot but I think he would definitely make a great dad. My, my intuition tells me it's the missing piece in his life. Okay. Is, is, but, you know, he helps so many other people and yeah. takes other people under his wings. And so maybe that's, um, you know, enough for him. All right. Um, we talked about Delano, who I think is brilliant. Absolutely mm -hmm. brilliant. I love Delano. Um, uh, let's talk about Royce White. Royce. Okay. Okay. So, first of all, you and Delano have very nice backdrops when you do your bits on uh, on Fearless. Mm -hmm. Royce White looks like he's doing his from some kind of underground radical cell somewhere, right? <laughs> I mean, there's nothing on the wall. It's just blank. And the guy is freaking brilliant. I love Royce White. He uh, is. And, he, and I think he manages to be more serious than Delano, which is hard to do, by the way. Right. Um, what's your what's your take on Royce? So I was shocked that Royce is so young. I think that I looked him up and he was born in 91. Mm -hmm. I think it. So I'm like, gosh, I didn't realize that he was so young because he is so smart and he is, you know, so wise. I was surprised by his age. But I love Royce because so him and Delano are both just full of wisdom, but the difference is. Royce is a little bit more militant. Which, Royce is more anarchic <laughs> is what I would say. Yeah, yeah, which I like because that's just a little bit more manly, you know? <laughs> right, exactly. 
Yeah. But, you know, I, I think that he's on his couch, you know, when he, he is on his couch and there's nothing behind. This is where yeah. he is, right? Yeah. Delano yeah. goes to the studio and then I'm here at my house and, you know, this little backdrop is from. It's it's still something, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. TJ Mo, I love TJ Mo. You got to meet him in person. Yes. Um, very smart dude. Again, it looks like he's doing his show from his parents' basement or something. You know, I'm trying to think. I, I can't really remember what TJ's background looks like. It I doesn't look like any Kim's in my head, but I can't think of what TJ's look like. But he is great, great guy. When I we were in uh, Nashville this past week. He made sure I got to where I needed to go, made sure that I ate. It was just, I really feel blessed being around just a bunch of men that understand their purpose in life is to be men. Yeah. And it has just been a blessing for me growing up an only child. I did have three uncles. So it kind of takes me back to my childhood where my uncles just were, they could do no wrong. That's how I feel about all of these man and fearless like i'm just surrounded by a bunch of manly men and it's just so great like even with the podcast that i do i'm the only female and i have two male co-hosts it's it's wonderful <laughs> and tj is um he's just very solid right he's solid he's clear i mean you could tell that he you know he he's worked on himself he took three years off from not making the national football league and said, who am I? Um, what do I need to know about myself? Right. And it's like, yes, he's prepared himself to be on this next journey. I was like, now Steve Kim is a trip, right? He's a he trip. Is. He's very <laughs> funny. He's not afraid to go toe to toe with Jason, which I've seen a couple of times, mm -hmm. but me, you and Steve Kim all have something in common is that we're all only children. Right. Oh. Yeah. So, and Steve cracks me up, but again, Steve, you need a little help on the background there. The Snoopy dolls are little, little, the little VHS tapes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, Oh, Steve, there's a thing called a microphone. You may want to invest in one. It could be helpful. Right. Yes. But, yes. He, but he's really smart and his ability to connect things in pop culture and drop references, rap references that make Jason's head spin. Mm -hmm. it's just really impressive yes that's why I can listen to Steve like although I'm not very interested in sports Steve makes it interesting that I'm like oh well let me go look up this person or let me go see what's going on with this game or whatever because he will make a reference that I'm familiar with whether it's a movie whether it's a rap song um so we you know we connect in that way I found out that just as I was watching Insecure this past season, he was watching Insecure. So he would <laughs> talk on Twitter like, what do you think about this episode? Or, you know, and um, he just knows a little bit about everything. Uh, he's been here, I guess, in America for a very long time. I watched some of his one-on-one -on -one with Jason because I don't know if you got to see over the Christmas holiday, Jason did one-on-ones with Steve, Kim, Delano, and Roy. Saw them all, yep. Okay, yeah, and so I was like, wow, you know, Steve is American, you know, <laughs> and he's yeah. just so familiar with everything. But he I might be Mexican-American, because apparently all he hung out with was Mexican dudes in right. L.A., right? <laughs> That's Steve yeah. Kim in a nutshell. All right, I saved the best for last. Your biggest fan, Uncle Jimmy. He is. Uncle Jimmy is a mess. <laughs> <laughs> like the Uncle Jimmy that you get to see is really who he is. Like, so I think people meet me and think that I'm a lot calmer than how I come across sometimes in a video or, you know, on Fearless. Uncle Jimmy is the same. He is the exact same, just cracking jokes, being silly. Um, when I was there, this was my first time getting to meet him because the first time I went to, to Nashville is when he was in the hospital. So I didn't get right. to meet him that time. Silly, just silly the entire time, cracking jokes. We worked on a video. I guess once it's done editing, it'll come out just 
you know, a comedic skit and um, easy to get along with. Just really, really, really funny guy. I actually think Jimmy is a comic genius. Yes. Right off the top of the head. Like, I don't consider myself funny. People think that I'm funny, but I've never considered myself to be funny. I think that because I'm Southern and the way that I say things, sometimes it comes across funny, Mm -hmm. but I'm never trying to really crack a joke or be funny. I'm just saying how I feel. And, but with Jimmy, he's truly funny. And like, he knows that he has that gift and it's amazing. Yeah, it's great. All right. I'm going to play one clip here. And then we'll get on now because I know you got a big uh, interview coming up here uh, with Newsmax. So I'm going to play this. And the clip is what, five minutes, 25 seconds. This is you. And I think you're talking about Randy Moss. Okay. And uh, Randy Moss and his, his little pity party. So here we go. Let's do that. There she is. And let's let it rip. Order, let the m- burn. You know, no one's really worried about Randy Moss, and you shouldn't be either. If there was a fight, the only sponsor would need to be Kleenex to, to help him with his tears because he's just crying, you know, like a little bitch. So nobody's really worried about him. He can say whatever he wants to say now in hindsight, but you you cried, you looked weak, and it is what it is, and you got corrected by an older masculine man, and that's what needed to happen. And sometimes that's what we need. This is an exhale moment for me because you know we we talk about waiting to exhale i have been waiting to exhale for men to just stand up and be men so i'm so excited you know that part in the movie where uh, angela bassett throws the, the clothes in the car and backs the car out of the garage and then she lights her cigarette and then tosses the match and just walks away from the flame. That's how I feel. If feminism was a house, I would be cheering right now. The roof, the roof, the roof is on fire. We don't need no water. Let the burn. And and now out in public spaces, we've created a culture and a society and a climate where we have to conceal who we are. We have to live a closeted life. I, I want to skip ahead to your song. Okay. This song is the best. Hold on. Women are worried. Okay. All right. Here it is. So you're doing a riff on R. Kelly, right? Mm-hmm. And you're talking about feminism and this whole R. Kelly uh, kind of riff parody. R. Kelly may be locked up now, sad and broken hearted, but we're about to celebrate straight men coming out the closet. Women are worried, those who like to be in charge. They're like, we've got to do something before this shit starts. But I was like, shh, bitch, wait a minute, don't you dare try and stop it. Let these men do what they do. They're coming out the closet. Now we have feminists shaking in their timberlands like oh 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 damn we thought we could replace man black girls like oh no white girls like please stop your bitching for they come together put us back up in the kitchen (laughs) shabika when i saw that i died I thought that was one of the funniest damn things. That was that was brilliant. And you so you mocked that up just a little bit, right? Yes. Yeah, so I I Jason talked to me that he wanted to talk about, you know, straight men now kind of standing up, masculine men, and they're coming out of the closet. And he he said, you know, like it feels like, you know, R. Kelly's trapped in the closet. And I heard him and it's like. He was like, you know, I think you could do something about that. And I'm looking, he's like, you got about 30 minutes. And I'm like, okay. (laughs) And if you know Jason, you know, Jason is like, when he says he wants something, that is what he wants. So I'm like, 30 minutes. Thankfully, I was familiar with 
you know, R. Kelly, I was an R. Kelly fan. So I'm like, what can I bring to make a point as well? So yeah, that, that's kind of how that came to be. So it was perfect. It was one of those <laughs> moments where the internet just, you know, broke for me in that moment. And uh, Jason, you could tell he had a, he had a great time with that too. Um, well, listen, thank you for coming on today and I really appreciate your time and I wish you continued success and even more success. And I hope you get to, you know, build your platform and, and reach more people because your message is a really, it's a good one. And it's thank about you. women being women, men being men, uh, getting beyond a lot of the divide and conquer stuff and, you know, finding the, the real heart in life and, and in people in general and yes. not, not allowing the, uh, uh, the ghosts of our past to determine the potential of our present, which I think you're an absolute uh, shining example of. Thank you. I appreciate that. So is there anything you want to share with people? Where are you going to be, where they can find you? Anything else? Um, let's see. You said this airs Friday. So yeah, this Friday. That's right. Mm. Well, I know that I'll be in Dallas for a conference uh, February 3rd through the 5th. I think I'll be at CPAC this year. So people can really just, you know, I pretty much tell where I'm going to be on social media. But if you go to ShamikaMichelle.com, you find me there. You can find me anywhere. And I'm updating my website so that I can keep my calendar on there and people can kind of know where I am and when or what I'm doing. Cool. And I follow you on Twitter. And so people can also follow you on Twitter as well. Yes. Which is a good place to do that. Shamika, thanks again. Really appreciate your time and just keep doing all that good work. Thank you. You know, I have a question for you. Yep. So I think, oh, wait a minute. What am I doing here? Somehow I got in my documents and I've been, I've been editing stuff that I didn't mean to edit. So I was looking at your uh, stuff and you're an astrologer. That's right. Yep. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? I am so um, interested in that. Yeah. So I started doing astrology full time back in uh, 2008 and through uh, just a weird set of circumstances. But I've been studying astrology and a few other things since my early 20s. And that's pretty much how I make my bones as an astrologer. I work, mm -hmm. with, I work with people um, and I have a astrological uh, podcast airs on YouTube on Sunday nights. It's a pretty popular one. Okay. And, and it's, uh, I, I mean, to me, it's a really interesting tool. Okay. I, I don't, I don't prescribe that it has any kind of um, magical powers. Mm -hmm. Right. But there are things that are there that are, very important, very, very important just, just in terms of a person's map for their life. Cause that's how I look at astrology as a map. And if you go into the Bible, um, Jesus even says, um, you shall know a man by the place of his birth. Right. So he's really talking about an astrological chart actually. Mm -hmm. And there's astro theology all throughout the Bible, which I don't try to get into. I'm not here to convince believers that astrology is, is a thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I've had to go through some challenges. I ran for city council here uh, in the town that I live in. And the guy, one of the guys I was running against found out I was an astrologer. And he said that I was, uh, I ran a, a, a cult and I was a practitioner of the dark arts. And, you know, so I have to go up against uh, this stuff. And I come at it from astrology is a system, right? right. But there is something behind that system. And that system is what I would call God. And mm -hmm. God, God is in everything, including, mm -hmm. the, including the planets, which have vibratory relationships with everything else in the universe, just like you and I are having a vibratory relationship now. Everything exists on a vi vibrational level. So mm -hmm. it's just being able to understand these relationships between these um, these luminaries in one's chart. So that's pretty much what I do. And uh, I've been pretty successful at it. 
I was going to ask you your sign. I didn't know we could go there, but I was going to ask you your sign. So do you do tropical or Vedic? Oh, I do tropical. Yeah. So uh, tropical, my sun sign is Aquarius. Mm -hmm. My moon is Pisces. Mm -hmm. And my rising is Sagittarius. So I was trying to think about who you were astrologically before we got together. And so I came down, I came up with four signs. Okay. Right. And mm -hmm. the first sign that came to me was Sagittarius. Mm. And that's your rising sign. And then I right. thought, okay, she could probably be an Aquarian because she breaks a lot of these molds. Right. So that was in there. Now the hair threw me off a little bit because you got that. That's a Leo look, right. With the, you know, with the hair. Right. Um, <laughs> but, but I was definitely focused on Aquarius and Sagittarius. And I did for a minute ponder a little bit of Pisces, but you're too, uh, you're too fiery for Pisces. You're too um, radical for Pisces in a lot of ways. So I wasn't, oh, that, I wasn't, I wasn't that far off actually. Yeah, you did good. And actually in Vedic, there's no Pisces in my uh, chart. It's mm. just Aquarius, Aquarius, Sagittarius. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and Sag <laughs> Sagittarius is the truth teller. So, right. That's, uh, that's where it comes from in your charts. Is that ascended? The other thing too, Sagittarius, classic story, Sagittarians will go through the heaven and hell experience, right? So they will go through a period where they're either debauched or they're um, in their bodies or they're just into experience for experience sake. And then they do mm -hmm. this, and they do this flip and they come very, they become very moral, right? And they go to the other side. It's a big Sagittarian thing. And then, oh. and then you did it again, once you kind of got through your ordained ministry part. And I think that's the Aquarian in you that just does not want to be pigeonholed and right. put, it, put in a bucket. Yeah, for sure. I do not want to be like in a box that bothers me so bad. <laughs> well, if you ever want to have me on your show, talk astrology, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, we're going to have to do that. I'm, I'm actually going to text them right now. So we have to bring him on so we can, uh, for the podcast, because we love talking to different people. Yeah, I, I may ruffle a few feathers, but that's okay. That's okay. I'm good Come with that. All. I'm good with that. <laughs> well, listen, thanks again. And thanks for asking that question. That was a cool question. Thank you for having me. Okay. Shamika, Michelle, we'll see you down the road. Have a great day. Have fun on Newsmax. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye for now. See you. All right. Wow. Wasn't that a great interview? <clears throat> I thought that was really awesome. Really awesome. Let me do this. Let me get rid of this. Let me just uh, close this here. Yeah, that was, that was, uh, she's, she's so authentic and so real and so funny. And that question at the end, I'd like to say it took me by surprise, but not really. Kind of did, but I, you know, I had this feeling that she was into just different stuff, right? Like when you walk away from the church like that, you're going to be into different stuff. You're because you're on a quest for truth, and when you get that Sagittarius and Aquarian combination, it, it's you, you, you have to keep moving through these systems so that you're continually refining the authenticity of the self, which is Sagittarius on the ascendant and Aquarius will drive that. And the Pisces moon, you know, that's not, that's, you know, should be born on a new moon. And, um, you know, new moon people tend to be experiencers, right? They want to have a lot of experiences in their life. And I like the Pisces moon. I think it's, it's one of the, uh, better placements for the moon can be compassionate and kind and, you know, and a bit prophetic too, actually. So yeah, I hope we get it together and I hope I can uh, be a guest on her podcast. That'd be a lot of fun. <laughs>